distribution. Again, what is it? Why do we need it? What do we need to do to maintain it? Um, some of y'all are mainly just running distribution systems now. Now that y'all are purchasing water, uh, not having some of the other dynamics of um, of the treatment itself. But we still need to know what kind of water quality we have coming in because it's going to affect our distribution system. It's going to affect um, our coronation, whatever's happening there, even if we're not re-coronating. Uh, it's still going to be something we need to think about. So we're going to look at types of storage. We're going to look at some of the big components of the system. Um, what do we need to use when we're selecting pumps? And then we're going to discuss a little bit about, about motors. Uh, why do we need storage? So every time somebody turns on the tap, you don't have the, a pump kick off, right? Like some of the small houses. You need to be able to equalize that demand. Um, Y'all get water 24-7? Okay. So y'all are filling your tanks. Are they worried about your tanks? Or how do you control your tank levels? Altitude valves? Yeah, altitude valve. Okay, so you use an altitude. So they're just sitting across the water. They're adjusting it. Okay. Um, low demand, if you're if you're treating your water and, uh, and distributing it, then low demand, you're going to have your daily cycles. You're going to have two, typically two cycles. You're gonna have your low demand periods after the morning rush and before everybody gets home and starts cooking again, and then overnight. So that's when you're filling your tanks. High demands are uh, early morning and then late afternoon. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna let us run our pumps at a better, better uh, operating uh, efficiency. We're gonna be able to run our well pumps or our treatment plant uh, more consistent rather than have them cycle a whole bunch energy, wear and tear, all of that. And then also on our uh, on our high service pumps, whatever we're pushing out in our system, we're gonna have a lot better uh, control uh, with our pumping rates. And again, efficiency is all about energy, energy is all about money. One of the things that we have to do is uh, supply a, a water for firefighting. We just talked the other day about what, how, I, how I think the, uh, the job that we do is, is really, really important for a lot of reasons. And you always hear about firemen and police officers and stuff like that. It's hard for the firemen to do his job if you don't have water in the mains. You know, our job is very important for the for the well-being of our community in many ways. Their public health, um, their firefighting needs, water is important. It's not looked at in a lot of ways. Energy, the energy sector always has a lot of you know, money going toward them and stuff. But uh, even they have a hard time making uh, making their product without us. You know, so. Uh, anyway, we do have to make sure that we, we uh, supply appropriate volumes at the, at the right times. And then we also need to make sure the storage is really good for our disinfection. We'll start talking about our uh, CT contact and our um, concentration right, for our disinfectants. Uh, if it's inside a facility, it's called a ground, it's called a clear well. Same, same uh, storage device. It's just a clear well inside the fence. Outside the fence, it's a groundwater storage tank. Uh, we have to meet certain requirements. Of course, AWWA is a primary requirement, and then also we have a state regulatory. Looking at our screens on our tanks, on our vents and stuff, need to have corrosion resistant, most people are using stainless. Gotta have the right size screens, gotta have a real small mesh. Uh, need to have regular inspections on them. Um, big tanks that have uh, overflows, if you have a flat valve, understand that y'all actually screen your flat valves is large screens and flappers. See, we just have flaps, but they'll walk up and they'll take a quarter and they'll stick it in there. And if a quarter slides in, you need to do something with it. It's a violation. So okay. you've got to lots of glass screws that like crawl up and hold them around there. Yep. And uh, and so screening is a good is a good technique. Uh, it can potentially reduce some of the volume that's being able to be discharged, but it's not not a huge amount, but it can be. So that's one of the things you have to think about. But that's a good way to, to prevent, you know, we're going to talk about a uncovered finished water storage, uh, which is, I know a lot of people, uh, it's hard to believe, but there's there's still some out there. Um, but yeah, we, especially on our flat valves, we can adjust them by putting counterweights and things like that, make sure the seals are good on the gaskets. Uh, if we do, when we have our entry point rooms, we've got to have a way to get in and inspect it. We need to make sure that we have an elevated curb around it because we don't want water running off the roof, getting into, getting sitting up around the gasket, collecting uh, bird droppings or whatever else, concentrating up there right around your entry point. 
Um, and then the uh, EPA rule is 200 gallons per connection for your uh, capacity. And I know we've been talking about in the state, y'all are talking about what, 24 hour capacity? So if you got a 10 MGD system, you gotta have 10 MGD available. What we do is we get by the average company for you. Okay. And then I have a dog up here. And that's their capacity. But it's not their, it's not their, it's not their design capacity. Right. We also have what their operational history is. Mm -hmm. And we'll look at that and see what they have interesting. Texas is real big on, you see, drive through town and you see tanks all over the place, elevated ground and uh, standpipes. And the older ones are the old standpipes. It's not used as much anymore, especially out in the hill country. Easy to put a tank up on top of the hill and now you've got um, elevated storage. As long as you're uh, 80 feet above your highest connection. Uh, ground storage tank, utilize a lot more. I guess y'all use the ground storage, y'all use it if these standpipes are elevated. So you get all your Huh? Very few. That, that's interesting. You drive around San Antonio and you just see a huge variety um, because they have to have a certain amount of elevated ground storage are typically at your primary pumping stations and then they'll push it off to elevated storage and then that's what's going to actually feed into your system with booster pumps. Because the elevation isn't our problem around here. <laughs> well, we have a pretty good elevational difference too. We got a lot of pressure zones in the city. We have 14 pressure zones, so we have a lot of division valves separating everything out. I was thinking asking what the elevation was. Yeah, there. about 700, 800 feet. Well, mm -hmm. it starts off about 600 feet above sea level and it goes to about 1,400. Um, and that's not a long distance, you know, for I, most of the time. I'm a little ignorant in geography. Where is San Antonio in the state of Texas? It is, if you look at the, the Gulf Coast, you're going to have Galveston, which is Houston is right above it, and then Corpus Christi is further down, about midway, a little past midway in your, in your arc. And we're just a couple hundred miles straight up from Corpus. So, um, yeah, Houston, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio is just almost in a straight line right there. Dallas, Austin, uh, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio. Um, and it's interesting because we're right at the edge of the hill country. So, coming out to my house, and I'm out in the rural county outside of San Antonio, so it's nice and flat. As soon as you start to go up, that's where I live. I live in the rock. I grow good rock. <laughs> you know, so we're right at the edge of the hill country, and then the hill country goes a long way back as you're going back toward El Paso, which is hundreds of miles. Yeah, Texas, you start on one side, you can drive a day and a half before you get to the other. Mm -hmm. um, some of these small states that we're going to go to, a couple hours, and you're, you're through it. So, um, Texas has a lot of diversity, a lot of geographic and um, piney woods to the Panhandle Plains, to the mountains out in West Texas, to the Gulf Coast regions. They have a lot of interesting. Right down around Brownsville, which is their tip, just a little ways into Mexico, they have rainforests. You know, so I mean, it's just a lot of a lot of interesting dynamics. <coughs> so um, ground storage is very important. Uh, we need to make sure that we have roof access, uh, not less than 30 inches if it's an old tank. We need to see about having it retrofitted so that we can have proper uh, entry into it. Uh, maintenance. How often are we doing our maintenance? I know y'all are looking at five-year cycles. Is that correct? Um, we were doing a lot of one-year cycles. We actually have people go in and our tanks uh, to do cleanings and, um, and, and videotape and stuff like that. Most of the time, that's five years like the doctor knew. Mm -hmm. like long, but most, yeah. of, most of these guys are... Yeah, and you got to do visuals real, real frequently, but you got to actually take them out of service and stuff every five. You know, they, you know, they dive tank and do robots. Uh, and then I take them out of service every day. Uh, yeah, all we'd have to do is we'd fill it up and isolate it, let them go in and, uh, and, and clean it and all. They have to disinfect before they go in, and you pull it back to you before you put it back in service. So it saves, a, it saves a lot. And, and if you don't have to do, I mean, you didn't have to get rid of that water. There's a lot of things that are beneficial about being able to dive the tank. It's a lot easier to clean. Plus, there's a guy who's an engineer from the system around here who does that. It's pretty reasonable. I'm probably still Good. Good side business. <laughs> yeah. um, so we talk about standards. We're not looking at OSHA standards. We're looking at AWWA standards. NSF approved AWWA is the engineering standards for it. Uh, no lead products. Uh, that's a big issue. Uh, it's slowly getting out of all of our systems, but uh, that was a, a, a highly utilized product for a long time. Now y'all are dealing with galvanized, which is another another headache. Um, and then, of course, we talk about our coatings, NSF. 
elevated storage. So anything up above the waters up in here, uh, this part here is just going to be piping and stuff, uh, access up into it. And then all your storage is up on top. Anything above the 80 feet is going to give you your pressure. And one of the things about <coughs> elevational head, it doesn't matter if it's one inch in diameter or 100 foot in diameter, it's not the volume, it's the height of the water that's giving you the pressure. So by having the water stored up high, uh, again, 80 feet above your um, highest connection is all considered elevational. The state of Te Texas requires elevational for uh, greater than 25 foot connections, you have to have it. Um, and then we have a minimum, we have a normal operating pressure of 35, and then the absolute minimum of fire flow is 20. And I know you all just work with 20. Anything above that's gravy. So they have to do 20 feet of side dynamic at all times. Okay. And, and if they're, they're flowing, it has to be 20 feet of side. Yeah, and, and Texas looks at 35 as your normal operating pressure. Then you have fire flow conditions or main breaks, things like that that you have to, uh, you still have to beat the, the, the 20. But I guess it's that, that cushion there at fire departments. And they, they, they've got that, we're out to save somebody's house or fly or probably basically whatever they feel like doing with, with gas systems. Yeah. Of all kinds of problems. Yeah. Well, we had issues when they, they go out the, uh, when we get into fire hydrants, we talk about the, the local volunteer fire department guys and stuff, but uh, one of the big things is, is they're coordinating with you and they're gonna go out and do some testing and stuff. And they're gonna go practice, because we have them out on the outskirts of our system, little bitty areas, and on a Saturday, everything, your pressure's dropping, your tanks are dropping, trying to figure, you got guys scrambling, going out there, figuring out what's going on. There's the fire department out there playing with hoses and stuff, you know? It's like a phone call, and I can push some water that way, and I can plan, or I can tell you, move a little bit, go somewhere where I have more water. So uh, coordination is a big issue. Uh, they had a huge fire. We have an old historic university uh, in San Antonio. They had a big fire in the main building, a lot of old historic documents and all. So it was like a seven, eight alarm fire. Everybody's pulling little pipes, old part of town. So they were pushing water, I mean, as hard as they could. They had the CEO in there, and the COO, the, uh, the VP, the director, everybody was in the skating control room having People running out, making sure you know, just pushing water as hard as they could, because that was a huge, a huge issue. So I mean, it's almost they didn't, and then they start shutting stuff off. They don't call either. So now you're you're about pulling vacuum and collapsing the pipes. Now you're gonna push because they're pushing water. But, <clears throat> so anyway, the phone does work. I tried it. Right, call me. Um, anything above 80 feet. When we start looking at our calculations, anything above 80 feet above your highest connection uh, equates to 35 psi. So that's how those calculations work. That's how they can figure out the basically 81 foot of, uh, above that is elevational. And stamp pipes can do that. If it's up on the side of a hill and you're feeding down below it, um, then anything above that, 80, 80 feet above that highest connection is gonna be uh, elevated storage also. So this is a typical stamp pipe. <coughs> a lot of times you see them on the side of hills in San Antonio. It is uh, it's tall, and, tall and thin. And usually built up on elevated ground, and then it'll actually meet the criteria. Uh, and you do have to have it coded with all that access points. Uh, real tall ones like that are a lot of fun to go and climb. You know, uh, ground storage are a lot easier. It's easy to get up on top. Uh, not a lot of people are using hydrodynamics. It's this vertical tank here on the side. What it is, it has an air compressor, pushes air under the top of it, and makes a cushion. So if you have a surge, it'll it'll uh, absorb that surge or your handle through your, uh, through your water system, and then it does apply some pressure, but they're only used in real small systems, and the uh, biggest issue is your uh, uh, mechanical maintenance on the air compressors. It goes out, now your system's waterlogged, you don't have any pressure, you don't have any surge protection. Mm -hmm. Looking at our uh, maintenance, recommended is uh, annual inspections. Uh, if you're just doing exteriors and off, if the state says five years for interiors, Unless there's an issue with it, yeah, well, they have to be inspected every five years. Okay. And based on what the inspector finds, the determines on whether the government may do, do something now. Yeah. Generally, most of these guys, I mean, it's such, such high expense, long lead time things. 
most of these guys have plans that they've developed so that every year or so they're yeah, doing insane. something because they just can't afford to do it all at once. Yeah. So. Especially now when you got to go in and you look at how they have to drape, especially on beta tanks, you got to drape them so that when you sandblast, especially when they had old lead paint on the older ones, they have any kind of paint issues on them and priming them and stuff, it's a, it's a lot. And we had a real good uh, tank program in house. I was certified to climb tanks and all, so you got to be certified to climb. Then you got to be able to go and do your inspections and stuff. So it can be a lot. So a lot of times they are going to contract, uh, and it just makes it easier. You don't have to invest that time and energy into, into that aspect of it. Um, you got to meet your standards. Got to have some sort of corrosion protection. We'll talk about some of that. Some of it's cathodic. Some of it's coatings. Some of it's water. Making sure you have stable water. That's an important part of uh, corrosion protection. Gotta have proper signs, gotta let people know who you are, who to contact. Some of the best calls I ever had was people calling, hey, I was driving by and I saw water shooting out of the ground. You know, you got leaks out there, you need to be able to know if you're, the public is the one that's gonna help you out. Uh, groundskeeping, especially from the uh, uh, regulatory perspective, if you show up and everything's real nice and trimmed, you know, that's, that's a good sign. If you, if you gotta hack your way through the jungle to try to find the, uh, the tank, Probably haven't been out there very frequently, so uh, uh, a little bit of groundskeeping can go a long way. Public perception is really important. You know, that's uh, when you have to go to them for uh, rain hikes and all of that. Uh, try to give them the least amount to, to complain about as possible. Uh, we talked about sanitary protection. Uh, you didn't have to have a residual, even though where underground storage tanks are located close to our facilities, uh, especially the old abandoned uh, fuel tanks and stuff like that. A lot of issues with leakage, so all of those are sources of, uh, of uh, contamination into our system. Um, if you got you got to do repairs properly, contaminants from surface, from uh, you know we talk a lot about homeland security. How do we protect our our facilities from being uh, compromised by individuals? And we understand about differential pressures, how easy it is to overcome system pressures in certain as, you know, aspects. So we gotta be careful about what's going on out in our, in our distribution system. And especially if we have hydrants that are way out where people aren't around a lot and stuff. I talked yesterday about one of the systems, they lock all their hydrants. It's an easy source of contamination. So if, somebody has the, if somebody has the motive, and the means, um, so we have to pre prevent about a lot of these different types of contaminants. And then anytime we have construction, we need to disinfect. Uh, what do we have out there in our system? For y'all, you probably got you know, a small pipe and a couple of little taps coming off. These big systems are running, what are y'all's mains? What you, how big are your mains? You got 12s, 20s? Four and six, mine like. Four and six inch mains? Four and six inch What do y'all have out there those systems? How big are your mains? Well, now we got some 20 inch mains. We had, uh, going down to our ASR facility, we had a 30, 30 mile pipeline of 60s. What is a 60 inch pipe? Big pipe. They hold 30 million gallons of water. And then they were putting in some 92s for um, an expansion project. So when you talk about walking the pipeline, you're literally walking the pipe inside the pipe when they're looking at the uh, the welds and the, uh, and the grouting. So they use steel with a concrete line. So that, that's, a, that's a monster pipe. But, uh, so it's just interesting when you look at, but you, you have what you need. There's no need to have a 60 inch pipe if you're not pushing that kind of water. So you, sizing of your mains is very important. It's just interesting to see the, you know, the, you, know you got a, 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 a two inch or two inch or four inch more inch than me. Yeah, mm -hmm. up to, you know, some, some really big pipes. Uh, so we got our mains, we got our service lines coming off, we gotta be able to wait to get our revenue, we gotta have some metering devices. Um, we need it at our, at our wellhead or if we're bringing in water, we need to be able to have that available. And then we need to be able to isolate it, we gotta be able to flush it, we gotta make sure we have enough pressure in our system. Um, and then of course we gotta look at our minimum pressure requirements, which is a, which is a big deal. Uh, talked earlier a little bit about pipe materials galvanized pipe. I don't know who was uh, who was selling that, but um, 
you know, it sounded, it sounded good at the time, I'm sure. Uh, ductile iron is, is, you know, real normal. Uh, some of the big, some of the bigger mains or some of the, you know, your cast iron and stuff or your steel. Uh, anybody deal with uh, AC pipe, asbestos concrete? You know, you have some in your system? Okay, you all get rid of it? Or are you just trying to ignore it? I guess ignore it today. Yeah. What do y'all do if you have to do a repair on it? Y'all have uh, We make SOP. sure there's no more in the country. <laughs> <laughs> then we stop it. There's a lot you of... You have special fees. And well, and also even just cutting. If you've got to go in there and cut it or anything, you've got to be real careful about, about exposure. We had a lot of AC. I guess the salesman that was up here selling galvanized went down here to sell AC. Uh, and, and asbestos as a product um, is works very, very well. There's just some really bad side effects, and that's what it's... It know. is a good pipe as long as it don't fail. You know, that, you know, when it fails, it's horrible. Yep. Failure rate on what we have is, is minimal. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, you look at the insulation and stuff like that, um, the thermal protection, it is, a, it is, it works very, very well. It's just the cancer side effects and all that other stuff is, um, but you have to protect yourself. So if you are dealing with it, make sure you have a good SOP in plan, make sure you don't have the cowboy jump in the pipe with the, you know, with the saw and he's going to chop saw and he's going to, you know, I've been there, done that with, luckily it was ductile and stuff, but even then you still need to have good respiratory. So it's a, because it'll, it'll catch up to you sooner than later. Um, we talked a little bit about the HDPE. It's really uh, coming out a lot. They uh, go in and they're, have, does anybody have that in the ground? High density polyethylene? Yeah. Um, what was that? Um, Knoxville. Knoxville's good. And he, he's loving it. I mean, he's, uh, that guy was all over. <coughs> <laughs> they've been doing a little bit down there. EPA is really good at spending your money. <laughs> but you know, the thing is, is we have a lot of systems right now. Uh, San Antonio is trying to stay out of the, um, uh, off of the radar of EPA on the uh, sanitary sewer overflows. That's a big issue. So, uh, City of San Diego had a real big issue and they went into a real big comprehensive program of, of uh, preventive uh, cameras, you know, replacement, burst in place, trenchless technologies. Uh, slip lining, a lot of different things. So San Antonio is looking at San Diego for some of those solutions, and, uh, and a lot of it is you got to have people out in the system, got to have good cleaning uh, programs, and you got to be able to go in and run cameras in there and stuff. Uh, HDPE is on the, I guess Middle Tennessee and out on the west. They had some concern about it because of the temperature variations and fluctuates, and they they had some issues with I guess putting on some mechanical clamps and stuff. Uh, the guy out there by Knoxville, he loved it to death. I saw some pretty good size going in the ground uh, in San Antonio. I thought it was a real new technology. And uh, I thought it had a lot of One of the problems with it is you have to make sure you get a good contractor. They did it. You know, that's one of the problem tree systems in my room and they put them in. They basically have to get the contractor. And, you know, so that anyway, the contractor, you know, it has to be a certain temperature. Yeah. The, for the length of time, do the well just based on the ambient temperature, and if they're not doing it properly, the, you have leaks. Yeah. And if they're done properly with the dry equipment and stuff, it's great stuff. So yeah. It's mm -hmm. very chemically resistant, lasts a long time. Not going to work. Yep. Who was the guy that liked it so well? Um, was it Rodney? I'd have, I'd have to look it up in the book, but um, I've, got a, I've got his information. I'll give you his. Social intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> in just your feet. In uh, Texas, have they gotten into uh, where they'll let them do the disinfection and sampling prior to actually installing? The from, uh, some of the slip lining and stuff. What they'll do is they'll actually they'll put it all together, and then if they're doing the, the burst in place or something, the trenchless, they'll go in and they'll have it above ground. They'll isolate it. They got to do their pressure test on it. They'll disinfect it. Pull the back tees, and then they're able to pull it in and put it in, put it in service. Hmm. Yeah. And so there's a lot of advantages. Um, you know, again, it depends on your system, depends on the, the money availability and all. But uh, even we talked earlier about uh, soil, uh, our soil characteristics 
water tables can be a real big influence on our pipe selection, our material selection. So those are things that we need to look at. Um, looking at pipe joints, um, obviously we don't want anything with lead and solder and stuff in them, especially now with the uh, the HDPE, it's just butt to butt, there's no uh, spigot and collar anymore, so you don't have that kind of slippage. Uh, all right, don't. <laughs> Um, looking at our valves, we talked a little bit earlier about, about our altitude valves. Start looking at our different valves. We've got to either isolate the system or we need to control the pressures in it. So isolating valves, we're looking at cutoff valves, typically going to be a gate valve. We've got to have it to be able to isolate in our system going into our service lines. Uh, even around our pumps and stuff, we need to be able to isolate it properly. Uh, and then we're going to have our things like altitude valves, pressure relief valves, um, divisional valves. It's all the same type of valve, different name, uh, used for the same thing. Works off of differential pressures, and it's going to either open or close depending. Especially on big high service pumps, you're pushing out a lot of water. You want to keep back pressure on your pumps, so you're going to have a pressure sustaining valve put off your high service pump to be able to keep that back pressure, keep it in the pump groove properly. Um, and then just some of the examples, clones, diaphragms, and all. Um, fire hydrants, luckily a lot of them now are going to the uh, traffic coupling, so it's a breakaway, so you don't have the same issues of people running in and pulling, tearing up your, tearing up everything underground because they, they hit it at 40 miles an hour and it's rock solid. Um, that's one of the main things. We talked a little bit about the uh, volunteer fire departments. Nice to make sure that they actually have wrenches instead of pipe wrenches. You actually have an actual uh, operating nut wrench to be able to open and close it. Uh, we always joke about the uh, competition to see who can close it fastest in the fire department. If we can communicate with them about um, the, the, the impact that they have on our system because of that. <coughs> if they're out uh, doing a, a flushing program or something, if they're out practicing, we need to do, be able to meter that water somehow, especially with a lot of the accountability. That's, that's becoming a real big issue, and, and we should monitor it. Um, so that's the main thing about the hydrants. Obviously, if we're in our flushing program, we can hook up uh, auto flushers if we need to, if we have areas that are consistent problems.